among us this morning. And, and help us to grow and deeper into really what it means to walk in the gospel, not just as a destination, but as life. Because it is life. The gospel. You know, in life there are things that come along that changes our direction a little bit. One goofy one that happened to me, I think it was about 2002. I, I was, my wife, usually I, I fight going to the doctor until the last minute. Sorry, doctors. Um, but I, I was fighting it, and, and she finally took me to ER, and, and they, they took me in and, and determined that I had this infection that I needed, needed treatment and stuff, and they were admitting me, and they, they give you, you know, sometimes they, they gave me 10 milligrams, I think, of morphine. That changes you a little bit. Um, uh, in fact, I, I, it was about 10 o'clock when I was admitted to the hospital, and, and uh, the next morning I woke up, and I really don't recall much. Uh, but I looked down and I, I had a res, res, red wristband. If some of you in the medical community know, that's to tell you what you're allergic to. It said pig hair. <laughs> I have no clue what I told that lady the night before. <laughs> but you know, years later when I go in for a procedure or something and they ask you, are you still allergic to pig hair? Yes, I... <laughs> that's kind of a goofy change, you know, yeah. But we're not talking about something goofy like that. We're talking about the gospel of Jesus Christ. The power of the gospel. And I just want to pray as we begin. Father, I praise your name. Lord, as we sang through this morning, Psalm 25, that David, crying out with anticipation of the Messiah coming, Lord, I, I thank you for that psalm and that picture that we cry out to you and know that you have satisfied that cry with the gospel, that you have radically changed us from the inside out. There's nothing like it in the world. There's only one gospel. Lord, I, I pray this morning that, that we understand more through your word of what it means to walk in this incredible love that radically changes us from the inside out, that shows us a path of how we're to live day by day. Oh, Lord, I pray that it be true here, that we come to know your gospel in a deeper and a richer way every day we have. Lord, I thank you for those who have been walking in the gospel in the rich way that you've been pouring out through them. There are so many here, and blessings that have been poured out through those, those saints here who've been walking in the gospel. And Lord, I pray if there are any in this room that do not know your gospel, may it be now. May your spirit move in such a way that, that, that nothing will hinder them from coming forward and understanding the truth of your gospel that changes us. The old is gone, the new has come. Lord, I praise your name. May you be glorified by what we share today. And may your, your, your truth just enter the hearts of each here today. I pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. We are in a series where we're continuing to look at our mission statement and continuing to apply the mission statement that uh, I love here is that, uh, that leading people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ, that we are growing deeper and understanding what that means and in fact, the Word tells us that if you're not growing, then you're nearsighted and blind. That we are to be, continue to grow. And, and a couple weeks ago, we introduced that and talked about the, the, the importance of having a mission statement. And I trust that some of you are writing down that mission statement. If you haven't, I, I, I want to challenge you again. Uh, why does God have you on this planet? Why do you get out of bed in the morning? And, and last week, we introduced this passage as, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. This passage is, uh, is kind of a focus to help us to, to know this. I think I have a slide of it. You know that Jesus says these three, these three important things. Uh, follow Him. Follow Him. You, you know that word follow is interesting. I, I won't attempt the Greek uh, to pronounce the Greek, but what it really means is to come behind. Come behind Him. Come behind and follow Him. That we're called to follow Him. 
and that He, He will radically transform us from the inside out as we follow Him, as we come behind Him, and that we will become fishers of men. In your bulletin, I love this, and I pray that you, you are thinking about people to invite to this. Uh, this is an incredible opportunity. The gospel is going out in our community. I, I loved hearing the story behind this because Betty shared, you know, she watched these people in, in the community and she was wondering, do they know the gospel? She's seen a lot of these people, and as many of us do, that we come in contact with in our community, and we're wondering, do you know the gospel? And the Lord put on her heart and many others came alongside and this is an incredible opportunity that the gospel is going to be shared that evening on the 23rd because that's what that's about. And I love that how God puts that in hearts of people that to share His gospel. In fact, the end of the message, you're going to hear a couple talking about that opportunity that they had to share the gospel and what God did with it. This is a great opportunity. I pray that you are inviting you know, in, in, in the Old Testament in Deuteronomy 6.4, God says that the word Shema, hear. Hear, O Israel. That word in the, in the Hebrew is Shema. And it means to, to, to take intellectually the truth of God, surrendering it to our heart, and praying that He will give you the strength to live it out. It's a big word for hear, isn't it? Most of us, we think about hearing, just hearing it auditorily. But what the Shema really is about is taking in the truth, surrendering it to my heart that I can now live this out. And that's really what that picture is about. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. We're on a journey now in the, this process of looking at our core values. We I mean, understand our mission statement. And that passage is really just about helping us to keep a, a, a firm focus on what our mission is here that God has given us. And now we're looking at our core values. Last week we talked about the Word, the truth of God. Sanctify them, for this is the truth. The Word is the truth. And we, we talked about that as a core value. Probably many of you thought, well, these core values are so obvious. They, they, they are. You know, in some ways it's kind of like when you go to a wedding, right? You go to a wedding, you know what you're going to hear, right? Hopefully you know what you're going to hear. You're going to hear vows, Right? You know, why vows are so important is because they're hard to keep. The, the, everybody knows what those vows are really about, but the vows are, are public because they're hard. In a similar way, the core values are obvious. Yeah, the Word and today the Gospel. They guide us in how we are to live out what God has called us to. Like the Word, sanctify them in the truth. And today we're looking at the Gospel. The love of Jesus Christ poured out to us. How can we do anything other but obey Him and live our lives for Him as, a, as you heard Dan read from that passage in 2 Corinthians. This is the picture of the core value today. And the other two, in fact, I think I have a slide on this too. The four, the four core values is the Word, the Gospel, community, and mission. In the coming couple of weeks, we'll be looking at community. And we had an awesome short meeting this morning with the small group leaders. I'm so excited what God is going to do through people that are leading small groups and how God is going to work in that, in that picture. And then mission, and we'll talk about that in a couple of weeks. But like I said, core values are obvious, but they're, they're guide, they're guide us into how we are to live our lives and dictating that to us. The Gospel is central now as we move into the Gospel. It is central to every aspect of our lives in our church. It is central. You know, I, I wonder this question, how many of you could say this, is that, you know, if a person, a stranger, were to come to your house and spend 24 hours with you, would they see the gospel? Would they see the gospel in your life? Would they know it? That's kind of an unnerving question, isn't it? You know how when we invite people over, we're going, well, let's clean this up and do this. And, you know, in our house, sometimes it's stuff things in the closet. Then you forget about it and open the closet and it all falls on you. And then you realize what you've done. But really, I, I want you to ponder that question for a minute. If a person, a stranger, were to come and spend 24 hours at your house, would they see the gospel? See, it's central to every aspect of our life. The gospel is, is all, this is, this, is, this is life. It's not a destination. 
Unfortunately, I believe in sometimes what I've seen and, and, and experienced a little bit in my own life. It's like a destination. And then what happens? Do we really live out the gospel? That's what I love about this church and, and the, the hearts of so many is that we want to disciple people. You know, it's not just about, yes, importance of sharing the gospel, but then walking with people and giving them some direction on how to live this gospel out. And as we follow Christ growing up and more and more what it means to really follow and live out the gospel. That's what this message is really all about this morning. Is that how are we going to live that out? We allow the gospel to transform and to inform us on every aspect of our life. You know, you think about why we come back to this picture and we see it over and over and over in the New Testament. That one died for all like we read this morning reminding us because how quickly we lose sight of it. You know, I, I have to admit, sometimes I, f I hear this a lot and it's true of my own life, is that I forget. I, I stray away from it. I, I think about the importance of the gospel and then I'm grumping at my family. Or I, I say how important the gospel is and then I'm, I'm grumpy with people on the road. You know, how quickly it is that we lose sight. And we're reminded that it transforms every aspect of our life. And I pray that's the picture that we're going into this morning. That we're starting to understand the depths of what the gospel really is. I want you to consider that for a minute. Think with me for a minute. That one died for all. While we were still enemies, he died for us. And while we were still enemies of him, that's every one of us. Every one of us. Every one of us were, were sinners saved by grace, right? We were all enemies of the gospel. Why, He loved us. He died for us. I don't know about you, but what a mercy that He would do that for us. What a mercy that Jesus Christ would do that for us. And I want you to hear this very carefully. It is not your hold of Christ, but His hold of you. I pray you hear this, is that it is not my hold of Him, it's His hold of you. He's got a hold of you. If you've accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're living in this gospel, He has a hold of you. It's the love of the cross. Not a philosophy. It's not a, yes, it's a way of thinking, but it's not a philosophy. It is Christ. It is Christ and the Holy Spirit working through Him. We're justified by faith. The sovereignty of God and His pouring out His grace to us. The, his electing, unchangeable love. His redemption He's made for those He has chosen. It is not a gospel that will lead saints to fall away after they are called. It's a gospel of eternal security that hangs on to you, that holds you. I love that picture. I hope this is starting to add some definition as we go into this, is that this is an eternal security that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to have a picture of this and I'd like you to see this video. Seems like all I could see was the struggle Haunted by ghostly
I pray I see some smiles on people's faces seeing that because that you know this redemption. This is the gospel. I, I pray this starts to get a picture. We see a picture of it. I hope you see it in the mirror that you're seeing the gospel has radically changed you from the inside. And I want to spell this picture out as we look at the scriptures. If you'll join me in, in Psalm 20, 25. We're going to look at the first 15 verses of this, this passage. In fact, the worship team shared a song with you this morning that was actually straight from Psalm 25. And, and it, we believe, best that we understand, theologians understand this, is that David wrote this after his failure, after he had he'd failed with Bathsheba and, and then murdered Uriah, her husband. And, and understanding that David is longing for understanding this path. If you've got your Bible, Psalm 25, let's start with verse 1. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul, he says. Oh my God, in you I trust. In you I trust. Let me not be put to shame. Let not my enemies exalt over me. Indeed, none who wait for you shall be put to shame. They shall be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. I wanted to add the NLT. I was studying this in several, many times when I, I prepare, I read in quite a few different uh, translations. The NLT was interesting. It says, but disgrace comes to those who try to deceive others. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. David is longing for the path. You know, he knows that he has gone off the path horribly. And he's longing to know what the path is. Show me. Verse 5, Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. Remember your mercy, O Lord, and your steadfast love. For they have been from of old. Remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions. For the sake of your goodness, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, He instructs sinners in the way. Again, I drew from the NLT in this verse 8. And it says the Lord is good and does what is right. He shows the proper path to those who go astray. I love that. He leads the humble in what is right, verse 9, and teaches the humble His way. And all the paths of the Lord are steadfast, love and faithfulness for those who keep His covenant and His testimonies. For Your name's sake, Lord, pardon my guilt, for it is great. Who is the man who fears the Lord? Him will He instruct in the way that He should choose. 
Again, drawing from NLT in verse 12, it says, Who are those who fear the Lord? He will show them the path they should choose. Verse 13, His soul shall abide in well-being, and his offspring shall inherit the land. The friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him, and he makes known to them his covenant. My eyes are ever toward the Lord, for he will pluck my feet out of the net. In other words, he will guide the steps. Again, I share with you that David wrote this most likely after his failing. And he, and he longed for understanding his, the anticipation of what God's path is, the Messiah that's to come. And he did it in surrender. Notice his writing. If you can see his surrender in that I want to know and I want to follow this truth. See, when it comes to the gospel, we surrender to the gospel. No longer I who live, but Christ in me who lives. It's a surrendered, humbled walk. And I love this picture of David longing for this path to be given to us. And now I want to bring you forward to the picture of the New Testament of what Dan had read with us earlier in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Because now we're seeing the picture of the gospel laid out in a path after his coming, his dying on the cross, and he's rising again and he's coming again. That he's, this path is defined by the gospel. It is love, obey, enjoy. If you look at verse 5, 5.14, it says very clearly, for the love of Christ controls us. I don't know about you, but when I read that passage, I have to ask myself this question. Does it? Is it really controlling my life? Am I surrendering to the love of Christ that it's so overpowering in my life that it controls my life? In the NIV, it says compels. In the ESV, it says controls. That the love of Christ controls me. And then it goes further, and here's the gospel, because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. It's the gospel. See, the power of the gospel starts with love. And out of this, I can do nothing else but want to obey Him. And I want you to consider something. Probably every one of us in this room has done this. Try to be obey, or try to obey to get love. You know, that's nothing more than business. It's no different than me stopping at a convenience store and giving them a dollar and a half and they give me a cup of coffee. It's give to get. See, what the gospel is, his love is poured out to us. Will you receive it? Acts 26, 18. I was just reading this again this morning. And it's the, have you received the forgiveness of sin? To stand among the sanctified. It begins in this surrender to this love. And out of this then, I want to obey. I want to follow him. How can I do anything else to such a great love than to, to surrender and I want to obey him? See, this is, this is the picture of the gospel. This is the path. He loved us. Now I want to obey Him. And out of this is going to come this joy of following Him. And don't get, don't get lost in that joy because a lot of us in this world, we, we, we start thinking of our happiness instead of the joy of being known and that knowing Jesus Christ. See, the joy is knowing who I belong to and that He has me. And that nothing will change that this eternal security that I have in the gospel. This is that picture of love. Out of that, I want to obey, knowing that I belong to Him is the joy that I'll always have in my life forever and ever. That's the picture. This is the path. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm still recovering from last week, but I'm getting better. I want you to just, just add a little bit as we go into this. It is defined by this. And I, and I want to draw you a picture of this as we look at this and, and really start to, to understand this. In your bulletin, I think you have a little path. And, and I, you know, the Word talks about this path often. And, and I'm actually going to put you to a little bit of a test. I, I want to make sure John sees this, so I'm going to move this a little bit. And I'm going to put some equations up here. I just want you to let me know if you agree or disagree. Okay? Hopefully everybody can see.
What? Something wrong with that? Yeah? Do you remember the instructions? The instructions were very simple. I just want you to let me know if you agree or disagree. I heard a lot of disagree, but I didn't hear, what about the first one? Now you're telling me that it was okay, right? I, this is a little bit of a trick, but I want you to think about this for a second. About really, what does this mean to live out and live on this path of the gospel? You know, a lot of times we're really quick to point out when we see something wrong, but not so quick to see when things are right. Not so quick to go, hey, this was, you know, let me kind of give you a picture of this path. When I was about 12 years old, my father came to me and said, Tim, I want you to start taking care of the feeder pigs. Next day at school, everybody knew I'd been taking care of feeder pigs. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sure some of you know about this, right? And, and, you know, what I would do is I'd faithfully go out there every day, you know, and on the path that my father laid out for me, I would feed those feeder pigs. When I came in at night, what do you think I heard? Nothing. He knew I did. Not a word. One afternoon, we had an 1897 built barn with a hay mount. And uh, some of you know, we put up a basketball hoop up there. It was really good until you, you took a jump shot over one of those hay holes. <laughs> then you'd find the bottom real fast. And, and I was locked in a game with my friends or some of my neighbor friends that came over and we were playing the world championship. I couldn't quit. So I was off the path, right? I was off the path. What do you think I heard that night when I came in? Yeah, probably some of you might have been there before. Swedish words I care never to hear again. Did my dad do that to mess me up? No, he didn't. But you know, one of the things that happens to so many of us is that we get locked in this criticalness. And we, we think our job is to point out everything that's wrong. In fact, some of us may even parent that way. I know I've, I fall into that. My children have come to me and says, Tim, or Dad, you are, you are so negative because all you do is point out what's, what, what's wrong. I never know what's right. See, the Gospel is about how do I live on this path? And how do I love when people go off? How do I stay on this path even when I know people around me are going off? Sean Hempstetter, many years ago, about 35 years ago, actually started this study and it's been repeated in other universities. And, and it's this, as simple as this. Is he, he wanted to know by the time a person is 18, male or female, they have actually heard 148,000 negative messages compared to 3,000 on the path messages. That's a ratio of 1 to 49. I don't know about you, but that's a little alarming. And I think Sherry and I would probably be the first to tell you that, yeah, we fell into that sometimes. And, and you know, it's easy to fall into that. You know, here is this gospel, this mercy that's been poured out to us. How am I living in this gospel? How am I living in that? Even though there may be people around me who go off. What did David ask for? Your mercy. And how do you help me come back to this? And I, I, you know, I, I wanna, want us to think about what does this really mean to live out the Gospel? That when I am with people, when they go off, how do I love them back? Let me tell you of a couple of stories. And, and, and look into your Bibles in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 15 and 16. See, the living out the Gospel requires a complete change of perspective. A complete change of perspective. In this passage, it says, From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we re once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard Him thus no longer. We don't see people the same. We see people in terms of how Jesus... We start to see people the way Jesus sees them. Hurt. Lost. An old friend of mine from another church told me this. He said, you know when he came to understanding the gospel and living out the gospel, if you, he said it this way at church, he said you could see people coming in. If you could see their spiritual wounds manifest in a physical way, they would be in crutches and they would be in bandages up to their neck. 
And he said it radically transformed his perspective of how he started to see people. He started to see them the way Jesus sees them. From his eyes. Just started. See, that's what it means to live in the Gospel. That I start to see people. Let me give you a couple of examples. Years ago, there was a guy who, a father, he had a a 15-year-old and he caught him in some pornography. Horrible thing. And, and And he came at him, you know, in other words, he went off the path, right? And his father would tell you today if he was here, he said, you know, I made the biggest mistake in my parenting. I went off with him. And he came after his son. He says, how dare you? What's wrong with you? Can't believe you would do this. How many times have you heard Pastor Mike or whoever talking about you know, the importance of living out the love of Christ and then you do this? What do you think their relationship was like? It was horrible. In fact, you know, this dad called me about seven years after the event and he says, would you pray for me that I can get back on the path and that my son will come back and visit me? because he's really not talking to me anymore. You know, he missed it, didn't he? Probably every one of us have had an experience, something similar, how easy it is to go off the path when someone goes off. See, what the Gospel calls us to is that we have a different perspective, that we walk this path. Let me tell you another story of a dad with a son. He caught his son, and actually his son came and confessed to him and said, Dad, I've been in pornography. And this is a beautiful picture of walking out and living out the gospel because you know what the dad did? He hugged him. He said, I'm so thankful you told me. And, and, And then he says, I only have one question for you. He asked him, Acts 26, 18, have you received the forgiveness of Christ? Because the only thing that's going to heal this son is the gospel. You know, this dad told me that years later that his relationship with his son now as an adult, he can't get his son to stop talking about the Bible. Not that that happens every time. But it's a picture of what we're trying to say here. Is how do we live this gospel even when those around us, especially in our own homes possibly, when they go off and fall off the gospel or fall off the path. And I know this is tough. Every one of us, it's tough, isn't it? It's tough, but we're called. How do I stay in this this path? Because it requires us to see it from a completely different perspective. It's not just a destination. It's how we live in this gospel. This is why it's a core value. It calls us to how we are to walk this path that David longed for and that we we are called. And I need to step it up a little bit in time here. The Gospel powerfully changes the person from the inside out. Do you believe this passage? Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, has passed away. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Do you really believe that? You know, and probably every one of us who's been walking on this path for a time have had those moments of doubt. Yeah, we we fall into that doubt. And I I love the fact that the Word speaks directly to this. Jude, I think it's verse 22. There's only one chapter in Jude. It says, be merciful to those who doubt. You know, we can all fall into that, that kind of a picture. That's why it's so important that we are in a body of believers to encourage us and encourage us back onto this. But do you really believe this? Because it powerfully changes us from the inside out. Every time I think of it, I smile because it's changed me eternally, forever. And nothing will take that away. And I pray that you hear that this is what the Gospel is and the power of the Gospel. One last point before I have this couple come up and share with you about a testimony. The Gospel... The gospel is the only thing that consumes the whole human being. The entire human being. There is nothing like it. 
There is nothing that comes close. Paul writes about it in, in Romans 6, 17. If you want to move to that next slide. He says this, but thanks be to God that you were once slaves to sin. In other words, you were owned by sin. I don't know about you, but that's true of me. I was owned by sin. And I, it owned me because slavery is about ownership. And, and I was owned by sin, but it says, but have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. Martin Lloyd-Jones, I love his writing about this particular passage because he says, you see the whole man in this. The heart, the mind, and the will. That you become obedient from the heart. Obedient is about my mind too. Because in the passage you come to understand in your mind the truth of what the Word says to us. And you surrendered it to the heart. That now you, you are living in it to the, to the teaching of what the Word says. You're living it out in your will. He says that now that you're, you are slaves to righteousness later on in the passage. That now owned by Christ. It is the love of Christ that controls us. I pray this morning that you see the Gospel in a much richer way that it is a way of life. It controls us. It compels us that we live this out. The final thing that I want to share with you this morning is actually to come... And guys, if you could get me a microphone. I think, Dan, you could bring up a microphone to me. If uh, someone have it there. Oh, there it is. And, and I want this couple to come up. and It's muted. Okay, thank you. And, and actually, you know, what do, what do we... Do? Yeah, come on up, Ralph and Dolores. Come on up right up here. I, I heard this testimony and you've got to hear it. You've got to hear this testimony. And actually, uh, you know, what are we to do with the gospel? We're to tell. We're to tell people. And uh, they, they, they've agreed to come up and just share this quick story about telling people of the gospel. And, and I love their hearts about it because they don't want any glory to themselves. They want the glory to go to Christ. And I said, I'm sure that will come across. So, I'll, Dolores, you want to go ahead and tell them what happened? Oh, was it not muted? Let me unmute this here. How do I unmute it? There we go. Good morning. Ooh. <laughs> About a month ago, Ralph and I went to Kearney. Uh, we go down there quite often with my sewing machines. Of course, uh, I love eating at hy V. And so we were sitting in, we were in hy V, and the eating place was full, except for one table with one young man at it. And so we asked him if we could sit with him, and he said, why, sure. So we sat down, <laughs> and uh, of course I asked him right away what his name was, if he lived in town, uh, he answered all these questions, and uh, Ralph asked him if he had seen snow before, and he said, yeah, he'd seen it in New York. And he said he'd never heard of Nebraska before, so I asked him, well, where are you from? And he said, Bogota. no, Columbia. And my brains are working, where's Columbia? And then we talked to him about his family, and he said he's an only child, and his parents were police officers in Bogota. And so that led on more. We talked more about the college that he was going to, and he has two years left. And I said, uh, what is the main religion in Bogota? <laughs> And he says, Catholicism. And I said, oh, I used to be Catholic, but not anymore. And he takes his hands. It wasn't shaking like mine, but he took his hands. And he says, I got some questions. I uh, have a Bible, but I don't read it. And I haven't gone to church in a long time. So what's going to happen to me in the life after? What's, where am I going to spend whatever? And he's going on looking for words. And I said, well, you don't have to go to church, but 
he interrupted me at that point. <laughs> so <laughs> We told him that he did not have to go to church, but he needed to go to church. You know, the church, he needs the church, but the church needs him. I thank each and every one of you for coming out today. We needed you, and you came. Thank you. We talked, and he wanted to, uh, he indicated that he would like to uh, participate in the uh, sinner's prayer. We asked him if he was, if he was, believed that Jesus was his Savior, and and would he like to accept Christ as Savior and, and be a child of God? And we led him through that. He let out his hands, both one to Ralph and one to I, in high V. The place is packed. <laughs> and we all know Ralph's voice. I yeah. bet about 20 people heard the sinner's prayer that day. Yeah. Oh, I really but anyway, we led him in the, in the sinner's prayer. And uh, what has happened since, we really don't know, but we planted seeds. And isn't that what we're supposed to do, is Amen. be seed planters? Amen. We told him, surely there was a Christian organization there at the college where he is to look that up. And then I told him about the Solid Rock Christian Bookstore down on the east side, south side of, hate, of Kearney there that would help him with any questions. And, uh, of course, with a Bogota, Colombian name, it just, it just went right over our heads, and we couldn't remember it. But we prayed for him every day. So but We told him to get into the church into and the get into the Word. Yeah. That's where it is. But not only get into it, but to live it yeah. and surround himself with Christian friends. Amen. 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 Thank you, guys. Thank you so much for coming up. Isn't that awesome? That's what we're called to do. You know, and how many of us have, have walked away from a situation and go, oh, I wish I'd have shared. I, you know, pray right now that you have, you know, pray for those opportunities. And I love you sharing that testimony. And I pray, we need to pray for that young man. In fact, I, I want to pray to close here as, a, as the worship team comes up to close us. And I, I pray this morning that the Gospels become a little clearer maybe. A little deeper in understanding that it's not just a destination, it is a way of life. It's actually core to everything that happens here and everything that happens to us individually in our lives. And it happens in our homes. And, and I, I pray if there's anyone here who have not accepted Christ, that this morning will be the time. And I'd love to visit with you. If you've accepted Jesus Christ here recently, I would love to hear. We would love to hear your story. Also, I, I know that there are probably many that we've been praying for that would come back to the gospel, that would live it out. And I know the pain of knowing someone you love dearly that they're not walking in the gospel. I know there's lots of things to pray. And I, I, if, you, if you'd like, I would be, I'd love to pray with you today about those situations, whatever they may be. Please join me in prayer. Father, I thank you for, for the gospel. Lord, I thank you for the radical way that it changes us from the inside out. Lord, I thank you for the testimony today. Now, I pray for that young man. Lord, I, I thank you that he reached out his hands and he asked, I don't understand that you gave them words to share, to share with him. Father, I pray that you bring him to others that believe that will come alongside him. Lord, again, if there are any here that have not accepted you as Lord and Savior, may it be now. May you surrender. May you surrender it all to him and receive the forgiveness of sins, as the word says. Lord, I know that there are many that we're that, that those here that are praying for that will come to know you. Lord, I pray you give them courage and strength to stand firm and share. Live it out every day. Lord, we praise you. We love you, Lord. In Jesus, I pray. Amen. Yeah.
hill of Calvary, my Savior went courageously, and there he bled and died for me. Hallelujah for the cross. And on that day the world was changed, a final perfect lamb was slain. for the cross. I mean, there was no other way that we could be saved, and you know that, but the, sh the shedding of Jesus' blood. Thank you, dear Lord Jesus, for your faithfulness and obedience to go to the cross, and not only that, Lord, but thank you that those who have gone before us have been faithful witnesses of this fact, and that's why we're here today. Somebody shared you with us. So now, Lord, as we go out into this world, may we have that same resolve to share you with others. In your name and in your power and in your strength and in your peace and in your love, we go. Amen.